Chapter Five of the Dragon's Secret. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dragon's Secret by Augusta Hule Seaman. Chapter Five: An Exploring Party. Well, was Leslie's first remark. That proves one thing beyond a doubt. What? demanded Phyllis that it wasn't a ghost around here i never yet heard of a ghost who made a footprint the deduction somewhat staggered phyllis in her pet belief i suppose that's true she had to admit i never did either but the question is who did it and what did he want but leslie had been carefully examining the footprint you say what did he want have you noticed that this footprint doesn't look very much like a man's phyllis stooped over it you're right it's a woman's or a girl's here's the deep imprint of the little french heel and the narrow pointed toe must have been a mighty small foot she measured her own beside it still even mine would look much smaller in pumps or slippers instead of these comfortable sneakers might be either a small woman or a girl like ourselves but why is there only one i wonder mused leslie i think the answer to that is simple she walked on this narrow boardwalk up from the back road probably because it was easier or even perhaps so as not to make any footprints and just at the doorstep she may have stumbled or stepped off by mistake in the darkness perhaps she didn't even realize it again leslie had bent over the footprint she was coming in when she made it do you notice that it points toward the door phyllis stared at her what a perfectly dandy detective you'd make she exclaimed you simply take in everything you're just as good and even better laughed leslie secretly pleased however hurrah for us cried phyllis we're just a pair of natural Sherlock Holmeses. Now here's what I propose. There's something mighty queer going on here, I believe, and I'm willing to give up my ghost theory, because it does seem silly. But I want to investigate the thing pretty thoroughly, and the only way to do it is to get into that bungalow and see what has been going on inside. But Phyllis, cried the shocked Leslie, you wouldn't break into someone else's bungalow, would you? And besides, how could you? Pooh! declared phyllis in scorn as if i didn't know this bungalow as well as our own and the danforths almost as well as my own family too for that matter i've been in here a thousand times the danforths would be only too grateful to me for keeping an eye on their place for them they do the same for us and as for getting in why i've always known a private way of getting in when everything's locked up the danforths themselves showed me we'll get in this afternoon this morning i promised ted and father i'd fish with them a while but this afternoon i'm free where are you two girls they heard miss crane calling from next door and they started guiltily not realizing how long they had been away i must be more careful or aunt marcia will begin to suspect something and question me whispered leslie it would never do in the world to have her realize there was anything queer going on so close to us she'd pack up for home in a minute her nerves are still so uncertain coming aunt marcia that's so agreed phyllis between keeping it from your aunt and from ted and father we're going to have some tight squeezes, I foresee. Well, I'll be back after luncheon, and we'll do a bit of investigating. Good-bye. It was between half-past one and two that afternoon, when Phyllis again appeared at Rest Haven, a very auspicious time, for Miss Marcia was in her room, taking her usual long nap, and Ted and his father had gone a mile or more down the beach, to an inlet, to try the fishing there. The two girls had the whole vicinity to themselves. "'What shall we do with rags?' questioned Phyllis. I hardly think we ought to take him in. Can't you chain him up? Oh, I wouldn't dare. He'd howl himself sick and wake Aunt Marcia. You see, he's never chained. But I can turn him loose on the beach and let him chase hermit crabs, and when he's well occupied, we can slip away. They strolled down to the water's edge with the dog, who was speedily absorbed in the one occupation he found of never-failing interest. Then they slipped back to the bungalow, without his even noticing that they had gone. It was only when they stood by the side door of Curlew's nest that Leslie noticed something bulky concealed under Phyllis's sweater. "'What in the world have you got there?' she demanded. Phyllis produced a large-sized electric torch. "'How do you suppose we're going to see anything in that dark place without something like this? We certainly mustn't open any windows.' Leslie confessed she hadn't thought of it, and then watched with amazement while Phyllis skillfully inserted the blade of a knife in the crack of the door, wiggled it about a moment, and triumphantly lifted the hook inside from its ring and swung open the door. "'Hurry in,' she whispered. "'We must close this quickly before anyone can notice.' They shut the door in haste, and Phyllis flashed on her light. Then she replaced the hook in its ring. 
Now we're safe. You see, this is a little side closet like a pantry where the ice box is kept. They had the door made so that the ice need not be carried in through the kitchen. But that's a very poor catch for the door, just that little hook, cried Leslie. I should think they'd have something more secure than that. I suppose it is, agreed Phyllis, and they've often said so themselves. And yet it's just one of those things that never gets changed. Anyhow, nobody ever locks anything down here, only fastens things up when the season is over. There's nothing really valuable enough here to lock up or to be attractive to thieves, and so it has just gone on, and I suppose that hook will remain there forever. But come along, let's get down to business. This way to the living room. And she led the way along a passage and into the big main room of the bungalow. It was very much on the style of that of Rest Haven, furnished with attractive willow furniture and with a large brick open fireplace at one side. As Phyllis flashed the torch about in a general survey, Leslie noticed that the cottage was obviously dismantled for the winter. The furniture stood huddled against the walls. There were no dainty draperies at the shuttered windows, and the rugs were rolled up, tied, and heaped in one corner. "'Nothing seems out of the way here,' said Phyllis. "'It's just as the Danforths usually leave it. Now let's look in the bedrooms.' They journeyed through the four bedrooms with no different result. Each wore the same undisturbed air of being shorn of its summer drapery, with beds starkly stripped of all but their mattresses, and these covered with heavy paper. Then on to the kitchen, which seemed, of all the rooms, to wear more nearly its normal aspect. But even there everything apparently appeared as it should. It was in the kitchen that Phyllis stopped short and faced Leslie. "'Well, doesn't it beat everything?' she exclaimed. "'After all we've seen and heard, yes, and found, there's not a thing here that looks as if a living soul had been in it since Mrs. Stanford closed it up. Now what do you make of it?' "'Perhaps we haven't looked closely enough. Let's go over it again,' was all Leslie could offer. "'And isn't it possible that a person might come in here for some reason and not disturb anything?' "'Yes, of course it's possible. But is it likely?' countered Phyllis. "'But, as you say, we'd better go over the place again more carefully. If we don't find something, I shall certainly go back to believing in my ghost, and I guess you'll admit I have foundation for it now.' "'I'll tell you what,' suggested Leslie. "'Suppose we each take a turn with the flashlight "'and go over every room twice, first you, then myself. "'I noticed that, when you held the light, "'I had to follow behind and look over your shoulder "'or get in your way, and I really couldn't see very well. "'Now I'll sit in this chair while you go over the place, "'and then you give the torch to me. "'How does that strike you?' "'Good idea! You're full of em, Leslie. "'I ought to have thought of it before.' and while Leslie sat down rather gingerly in one of the willow rockers against the wall, Phyllis systematically examined the room again, diving into all the nooks and corners, and at last came back to hand the torch to her friend. "'No luck! It's as clean as a whistle of any clues as far as I can see. You take your turn.' When Leslie had completed her search, they proceeded to treat the other rooms in similar fashion, and so had come to the last bedroom when they were startled by a sound from outside the house. "'What in the world is that?' cried Phyllis in a panic. It's the most uncanny sound I ever heard. They listened again and caught the intonation of a long moan, ending in a rising note like a wail. It was truly a little hair-raising in the closed, forsaken spot. Suddenly Leslie giggled. Oh, it's only rags. He's missed me at last and traced me here, and is probably sitting by that side door now, protesting against having been deserted. Phyllis was both relieved at the explanation and annoyed at the interruption. "'Let's go and stop him right away, or he'll have the whole neighborhood here.' They hurried to the little side door in the pantry and snapped off their light. Rags from outside, sniffing at the threshold, sensed their approach and yapped joyously. "'But how are you going to lock that door after you?' whispered Leslie in sudden terror. "'It isn't possible.' "'Trust me,' smiled the capable Phyllis. "'Do you suppose I'd have unfastened it if I couldn't fasten it up again? I just keep the hook in a certain position with my knife as I close the door.' and then gently drop it into the ring through the crack. I've done it a dozen times. Leroy Danforth taught us how. Leslie breathed a sigh of relief, and Phyllis cautiously opened the door. Then both girls started back in genuine dismay. Sitting cross-legged in the sand, directly in front of the door, and holding back the delighted rags by his collar, was, of all people most unwelcome to Phyllis, her grinning brother, Ted. The consternation of the guilty pair was almost ludicrous. At least Ted found it so. Then Phyllis recovered her self-possession and demanded, "'What are you doing here, I'd like to know?' "'Please, ma'am,' 
"'That's a question I prefer to ask of you, and with a great deal more reason,' returned Ted. "'Of all the nervy things I ever saw, it's you prowling around the Danforth's closed bungalow and sneaking out like a thief when you thought no one was around.' Leslie felt herself turn red and uncomfortable at the accusation, but Phyllis seemed in no wise daunted. "'I guess if I wanted to show the place to Leslie, there isn't any particular harm in it. She's been asking me what it looked like in there and how it differed from their house. You know perfectly well the Danforths wouldn't care a brass farthing.' This statement happened to be entirely true, for Leslie had questioned her only the day before as to the interior arrangements, and expressed some curiosity to see it. She breathed a sigh of relief, at the ease with which Phyllis seemed to be explaining a rather peculiar situation. Ted, however, seemed only half convinced. "'If that's so, it's mighty queer that you look so guilty, and caught in the acty when you came out and saw me. And for goodness sake, how long have you been in there, anyway? This rags dog came running up the beach to us at least an hour ago, and I thought, of course, you girls were somewhere about. But when you didn't appear after a while, I began to get worried, and rags and I started off to find you.' He led me straight here, good old chap, and we've been sitting waiting at least fifteen minutes. Then he began to howl, and gave the game away. Now please explain all this. I'll explain nothing further, replied Phyllis loftily, and I'll trouble you to attend to your own affairs in the future. With which crushing rejoinder she marched away, dragging the unhappy Leslie after her. All right, just you wait. I'll dig out your little secret, he called after them. "'And he will, too,' muttered Phyllis. "'That is, if we don't use the greatest caution. "'Isn't it unfortunate that that wretched dog led him right here? "'However, I've settled him for the present. "'Now let's think about other things.' "'But it was not so easy for Leslie to forget "'the unpleasantness of the recent encounter "'and the implication that she had been caught trespassing. "'But Phyllis settled down to a steady talk about their investigations, "'and she presently forgot the impression. "'It's mighty strange that in all our careful search,' "'We didn't find a single thing that would indicate a recent visitor,' mused Phyllis. "'Didn't you see anything? Any least, little thing?' questioned Leslie. Phyllis stared at her in some surprise. "'Why, you know I didn't. What makes you ask?' "'Because I did,' Leslie quietly returned. End of chapter 5